Mr. Deputy President, Mr. Deputy President, I move item 1008 uh, outside the order of precedence, standing in my name on the business paper today. That understanding order 52, they'll be laid upon the table of the House within 21 days. Um, documents in the possession, custody control of the Office of the Premier, the Deputy Premier, Minister for Racing, the Department of Justice and the Department of Premier and Cabinet relating uh, to the government's proposed and now abandoned uh, ban on greyhound racing in order, this state. Order. Could members uh, just keep the volume down a bit? Uh, a. Any market research public opinion poll surveys or focus group research reports into the greyhound industry or the proposed and B, any legal or other advice regarding the scope or validity of this order of the House created as a result of the order of the House. Um, Mr Deputy President, like the previous uh, now defeated motion about Wentworth Park, we put this motion forward to the House to try and shine a bit of light on the decision making processes, I might say what appears from the outside to be the deep and flawed decision-making processes uh, of this particular government. Uh, when they received the lengthy report, the McHugh report, uh, about the greyhound racing industry, uh, the first recommendation was that the government should consider the future of the industry, but there followed 79 additional recommendations which constituted a road map towards, uh, if you like, more stringent regulation of the greyhound racing industry uh, in this state. It didn't, that course of action, the most substantial course of action proposed by former High Court Justice Michael McHugh, didn't recommend itself to the government. Instead, the Premier came out and said, based on that evidence, uh, he was horrified by what he saw of the industry, and there was simply no other choice for the government, no conceivable alternative course of action other than to announce a complete shutdown of the industry. And uh, he dragged the Deputy Premier, the leader of the National Party, along with him, and together they imposed this decision uh, on, on their Cabinet and on their unwilling party room and uh, on their even more unwilling supporters. because. Uh, what they forgot in their rush towards um, embracing what they said was a policy motiva motivated by their concerns for animal welfare, what they forgot was, of course, uh, the tens of thousands of people who would be directly affected, the people who might not make a large living but nevertheless derived their sole living from, uh, the, by the breeding and ra racing of greyhounds. And it was a very curious process by which the government reached uh, its policy, and uh, it was also unprecedented because when governments make far-reaching decisions negatively impacting an industry, or when they propose to transition an industry out, it is normal practice of governments to put in place structural adjustment packages. Um, but this government said, no, we're going to ban the industry first, we're going we're to bring legislation to the Parliament. We're going to ask the Parliament to enact it and then we'd work out how to deal with all the consequences after that. And they commissioned uh, uh, an esteemed person to then provide them with a report after the fact about what sort of compensation should be given to those who lose their livelihoods. Um, but the concern and the unease in the National Party and in the broader community would not go away. And in the face of this turmoil, um, the Premier, out of the blue, announced a complete abandonment of this policy of banning the greyhound industry, a policy not only reached by his cabinet, his party room, but enacted into law by this parliament. Even as we stand here today, Mr Deputy President, that Act remains on the statute books. There is an operative date of 1 July 2017 by which, by law, 
the greyhound racing industry and associated activities will be banned from 1 July next year. But despite the announcements of the government, they don't propose to legislate to implement their own policy until sometime early next year. So in fact, no one has any guarantees that what is now the government policy Order, order. Look, um, I don't wish to steal your thunder. Oh, please do. Uh, but there needs to be some oh, well, uh, connection with the motion before <coughs> the House. Well, the connection with the motion, Mr Deputy right. President, and I thank you for calling me back to the, the motion. The, the, the point of this is to try and explore the bizarre reasoning process and decision-making process of the New South Wales Government. How is it that in the face of all good common sense and previous practice of governments, they then they just initially decided to completely ban a whole industry without making any provision for the consequences. And that is squarely what the motion is directed to by seeking from the executive government certain information, certain information which we think may well explain that. And it, and it comes for this reason. Uh, as I indicated earlier in my contribution, the Premier said he was motivated by concerns of animal welfare. Uh, he was very disturbed by uh, the evidence in the McHugh report about uh, practices within the industry such that it couldn't possibly be addressed by regulation, by higher or better or more stringent regulation. The only conceivable outcome was to completely ban the industry. We don't think that's the case, and we think the information we're seeking through the Standing Order 52 may in fact explain more about what the true motivations of the government is. And I'll come to that next, because the Premier also framed the government's original policy, not merely as the best decision on the available evidence, but as a, as a moral choice. He framed it in terms of his own personal morality. It was, it was the right thing to do, and there was no conceivable alternative. And yet now, the policy of the Premier and the government is to not do that, is to actually essentially uh, taking up the theme offered by former Justice McHugh to go back to the course of action proposed by the opposition, both in this place and the other place, that is to take the path of higher, better and more stringent regulation. The very path the government said it could not do because the evidence was so overwhelming and so bad that you couldn't possibly do that. The Premier has now embraced a policy that, according to his own personal moral judgment, is wrong and immoral. Now, what does that say about him as the leader of the government and as a person? I mean, we don't think that's the case. We think the information that we're seeking in this Standing Order 52 may well shine a light on the government's true motivations behind seeking <coughs> the ban. Uh, this, uh, perhaps an attempt at cheap populism to chase uh, what they think may have been uh, the mood of the community, a mood which uh, subsequent, um, subsequent uh, courses of action have shown uh, to be a profound misjudgment. Because even uh, not only was there significant opposition to the government's policy from those most directly affected, uh, the industry and those uh, working in and around it, but even from people who, who if you ask them, said that they supported the ban, certainly didn't support the way the government went about it. This idea that you would, in a callous and cavalier way, shut down an industry, deprive people of their living and their lifestyle without making any provisions for the consequences. It was such a foolhardy and reckless course of action and, frankly, completely inexplicable coming from a responsible government. That's why we seek the information in the Standing Order 52 again to shine a light on the, on, on the, on the dreadfully flawed uh, uh, reasoning processes of this government. And we would ask all honourable members, the government, the crossbenchers, to join with us, because this is not a bill before the House. This doesn't affect <coughs> tens of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. This is simply using a mechanism open to the legislature to hold the executive to account to explore how and why government makes certain decisions. And we think the House should take this opportunity to continue to hold the Baird Grant government to account on this policy, because the policy was 
uh, hotly contested, both in the other place and in this place, and in the broader community, and in many other locations as well. And given where this uh, area of public policy has now wound up, with the government abandoning its original policy, but not legislating for their new policy, which means, of course, those persons who have taken heart from the government's change of policy really have no certainty about what the ultimate policy of this government would be, because the law banning the industry from 1 July 2017 remains the law of this state. And the government seems to have uh, no sense of urgency to give certainty to investors or those people who depend on the industry for their well-being and livelihood be no reason. Um, to give them the certainty uh, that the government says it is now provided for its change of policy. So I'd ask all honourable members to give favourable consideration to this motion, uh, to join with us in scrutinising how it is that this government and its leadership reached such a flawed outcome. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President.